Welcome to another edition of Our City. I hope all of our Christian friends enjoyed the holiday Easter and enjoyed the time with family and all of our Jewish friends. I hope you enjoyed your Passover celebration as well. A few things going around the city of Elizabeth this week as we warm up to warmer weather. On Wednesday, April 7th at 9.30, I'll present a proclamation in honor of Community Development Block Grant, the annual celebration of National Community Development Week. And this year's theme for CDBG, Community Development Block Grants, On the Right Road. It's a federally funded program that assists cities with improving the quality of life for residents. This year, the focus will be on the homeless prevention and rapid rehousing programs. The event will be held in city council chambers on the third floor. For more information, please call 820-4016. And on Sunday, April 11th at 9 o'clock, I'll attend and walk in the 14th annual Run for Children event. Just so you know, there's a run and a walk. It'll kick off at Union County College on West Jersey Street as it does every year. This year's proceeds will benefit the Union County Child Ad Advocacy Center and St. Clair's Home for Children in the city of Elizabeth. And our guest this evening will talk about those issues on tonight's show. If you need more information concerning this event, please call 820-4050. We spent an awful lot of time last month talking about the census. The time for the mail-in was due on April 1st. If you have not mailed your census form in, it is not too late. Please send it in as soon as possible. And if not, there will be people knocking at your door. Up till six times they will knock at your door between now and the summer months. And they'll sit there with you in order to fill out the census form. It's important to get a complete accurate count. It helps fund our hospital, Trinitas, gives us money for roads and transportation and police and fire. Uh, last 10 years ago, we had a 59% uh, count rate. This year, we're aiming for 70%. So please get counted. And tonight, I'm pleased to be joined by the executive director of the AIDS Resource Foundation for Children and the St. Clair's Home for Children, Miss Faye Zeeland. Faye, welcome to the show. Thank you. And also the assistant prosecutor in charge of the Child Advocacy Center, Mr. John Esmerado. John, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mr. Mayor, for having me. Well, you guys come back every year when we talk about this, which uh, right. happens to be one of the good things that government and the prosecutor's <laughs> office and county and, and Faith and your organization do when we raise money for kids. So. Faith, maybe you could tell us a little bit about you and what you do with the young people over there at the Age Resource Foundation for Children. Okay, well, St. Clair's Home for Children in Elizabeth is considered one of the first transitional homes for children with AIDS in the country. And now, in addition to caring for children uh, with AIDS, we care for medically fragile children. So we see quite a bit. I mean, as AIDS has become more manageable through the years, you've branched out and handle other uh, difficult situations. That's right. The good news is that we're seeing fewer and fewer children uh, born with the illness, but it has not gone away. No, it's not. And no, uh, not. so do you, do you still work with children with AIDS, though? Absolutely, absolutely. And then we do more and more work with families and old, older children. Um, because if pe uh, people are living longer, which means uh, you know infected people are living longer, so it's really important that behavioral that we have changes in in modifying behaviors, and it's really important that we keep uh, people who are infected healthy. And John, you're in the uh, prosecutor's office, an assistant prosecutor, and. You've been there for, what, 45 years now? Uh, so 19. Yeah. My hair was brown when I started. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe you could tell us a little about the work that you do over at the prosecutor's office. Right now I'm assigned to the Child Advocacy Center, and so what we do is investigate all forms of child maltreatment. That includes sexual abuse, physical abuse, and really profound cases of child neglect. And this is all involving children from infant birth to age 12. And if they're over age 12, uh, John, who, who do they... Uh there's a joint investigation with the city police department's juvenile division and the prosecutor's office. The reason that the prosecutor takes the lead on the infant to 12 is there are very specialized regulations and laws and evidence rules about how we interview children regarding sexual abuse. You remember, may remember many years ago the Margaret Kelly Michaels case in 1994 where the Essex County Prosecutor's Office had some very bad interview techniques and how they interviewed and tainted children's disclosures. Since that time in 1994, we have very open-ended interview techniques. We basically ask children what happened 
and they tell us in very non-suggestive format. And with that, the only evidence we have in these cases is a child interview. There's no medical evidence. There's no CSI. There's no DNA. All it is is the child's interview. So that interview is our best evidence from and age zero And Michael's case eventually uh, got thrown out, or thrown out. She received a 300-year sentence that was completely vacated because of the interview techniques, and it led to a revolution on how children are interviewed regarding sexual abuse in the United States. So from 1997 forward and 1994 forward, there's been every prosecutor's office and every child advocacy center when they interview a child does so in a very open-ended format. There's a movement by the American Prosecutors Research Institute to make sure that every state among the 50 states uses open-ended questions to elicit information from children. Not that children falsely disclose abuse, but the interview process is difficult. If it's not open-ended, there's a risk of some error coming out in facts that are generated. Since you did that, John, do the uh are there parents or other adults in the room at the time, or is it just you and the child? No, absolutely it? not. It's just the uh, detective and the child. And about 99% of the time, we're able to build a rapport with the child at the doorway and then invite the child in. And it's amazing. Children make disclosure. The mother or father is right next door. Our child advocacy center is a converted three-story Victorian home. So it looks like a house, and many children don't realize that these are police investigators. We don't have badges. We don't have guns. We don't have suits and ties. We have regular clothes. And, are just asking and you have stuffed questions. animals in the room and television and couches and chairs. So it looks like a regular living room set. We have a waiting room that's uh, almost uh, like any child's den or living room. And then we have an interview room that's a little more formal that has a fireplace and some child drawings, but anatomically correct dolls and drawings. So when we get to the most detailed form of disclosure, the child who can verbally describe what happened can point to what happened using a picture or demonstrate most clearly what happened using anatomically correct dolls. And if the parents are uh, a suspect in any way possible, they're not allowed in. No, no. We know very early on, working very collaboratively with our juvenile police division in Elizabeth and across the 21 townships in Union County, as well as with DIFAS, Division of Youth and Family Services, we have a good thumbnail sketch of the case before we get the case so we can segregate it out, segregate where the suspect is and where the non-offending caregiver, the mom, typically is. Faith, what inspired you to start the AIDS resource Foundation for Children, because we're going to bring your role and John's role together uh, on Sunday. So what inspired you to start this uh, center? Well, uh, we were inspired because of our concern uh, for children with AIDS. But when you talk about our roles being brought together, I think it's very interesting. Now we care for children uh, with AIDS, but at medically fragile children as well, which means that sometimes we see children who have been abused physically abused, sexually abused, and our home is transitional. So that means the child will stay with us uh, until uh, the, a, a permanent home can be found. And it's very important when a child's been abused that their next placement is a sensitive, caring placement. And John, is it common or is it you know, not as common as people? People don't pay attention unless it affects them, right? So it's, a diff it's an underground issue, sort of, but Certainly. then we see what happened in Trenton over the last couple of days, and you just get disgusted by the whole thing. There's a, a lot, of, lot is going on right now. So the general number is one in four girls and one in six boys will be the victim of an unwanted touch by age 18. There was a study that was released by the Department of Health and Human Services in Washington, D.C., indicating that for the first time on record over the last decade, we're beginning to see a drop in reported child sexual abuse cases. And the drop is significant in terms of substantiated sexual abuse is down 100,000. Now, this doesn't mean it has stopped. And we estimate through the Department of Justice about half the cases are reported, half the cases are not reported. But through things like Megan's Law, through isolation of offenders, through community notification, through very smart neighbors, through good parenting techniques, we are beginning to see a modest decrease in the overall number of cases of substantiated sexual abuse. But overall, the numbers remain relatively high throughout the county and throughout the country.